cannot wait for this panel. There are many esteemed guests that uh, I think are going to wow you with this next topic. It is called Humans and Robots Working Together. It will be moderated by the amazing Hoppy Price. He's a, an amazing human. He is in charge of the Mar Mars <laughs> Orbital Mission 2033 and co-moderated by the lovely and our board member of Explore Mars, Linda Karanian, Karanian Aerospace Consulting. Uh, of which she is the president. We have several online guests. Uh, hello, Dr. Michael Heck, the principal investigator of MOXIE, and many others. I give a shout out to uh, Michael in particular because he has said yes to speaking to kids so very often. So thank you all. Enjoy this topic. All right, I'm uh, Hoppy Price at NASA JPL. And uh, I work in the uh, Robotic Mars Exploration Program. I'm chief engineer. And uh, so in, in my job, I work with the uh, current operating missions at Mars, the three NASA orbiters we have at Mars, and uh, a couple of rovers. And uh, we're doing some exciting stuff on <laughs> Mars. In the past, I've uh, worked in doing studies with human missions to Mars, like the uh, NASA Design Reference Mission Architecture 5. Uh, I've worked on the Cassini mission, the Galileo mission. And uh, now I'll, I'll hand it over to <laughs> Linda Karanian, and uh, Linda's going to introduce uh, the rest of our panel. I, too, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Linda Karanian. I have a private consulting firm here in the D.C. area supporting uh, primarily NASA contractors, um, formerly with Lockheed Martin for a lot of years uh, in engineering and then business development. And to get us started, I'll just introduce our speakers today. We have a couple of gentlemen uh, virtually. Um, I'll start here with Rick Davis. He's the Assistant Director for Science and Exploration in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. In this capacity, he works extensively on Mars exploration policy. Rick also co-leads a joint agency study to identify potential human landing sites on Mars. He heads up the Mars Exploration Program's reconnaissance program to obtain the data at Mars necessary to enable human spaceflight there. Rick serves as the NASA lead for the International Mars Ice Mapper mission, which is intended to map the significant ice deposits at Mars. Before being assigned to headquarters, Rick worked at JSC in the Flight Operations Directorate. He was selected as a space station capsule communicator, or CAPCOM, in 2003 and served as the primary interface between mission control and the crews on board the ISS. He also worked as deputy director of NASA operations in Star City, Russia, where he was based for over three years. And Rick is fluent in both Russian and Spanish. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, then we have, um, who will join us virtually, Michael Hecht. He is the Associate Director of Research Management at the MIT Haystack Observatory, where he also leads the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment, otherwise known as MOXIE, which is on board the Perseverance Mars rover. Michael also is on the management team for the Event Horizon Telescope that images supermassive black holes from Earth. That is so cool. Yeah, yeah. As principal investigator for MOXIE, Michael's job is to lead the MOXIE science team through operations on Mars, analysis of data from the mission and from models in the laboratory at Haystack, and communication of the important findings to the scientific community. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Sherry Holder. Uh, Sherry is a senior space systems engineer at Draper Labs with research interests in space human factors, human computer interaction, and space systems engineering. Through her study of human behavior and performance, Sherry seeks to improve performance during space flight operations. Her ongoing work at Draper includes the study of robotic interfaces and lunar landing efforts. She's contributed to the real-time performance metric system for non-invasive human performance monitoring including uh, the Human Exploration, Exploration Research Analog, HERA, and NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, NEMO. Remember that one, because we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit more about it later. 
Um, and she was the technical lead for the human automa automation robot integration trade analysis study for NASA in coordination with UC Davis. And then we have Dave Lavery on the far left, my far left. Dave is program executive for solar system exploration at NASA headquarters, where he currently oversees the development of the Mars helicopter technology demonstration that we all, of course, know as Ingenuity, which is currently surpassing all expectations on Mars. For over a decade, Dave has led the NASA Telerobotics Technology Development Program with responsibility for content and direction of robotics and planetary exploration research efforts. Under his leadership, the program was transformed into a world-class robotics technology and systems development program impacting NASA flight programs, other government robotics projects, and the entire robotics industry. Among the major products of Dave's research program were the Sojourner Mars Rover, a free-flying robotic camera used on the space shuttle, Dante 1 and 2 robotic volcano explorers, and the National Robotics Engineering Consortium, which was established to transfer robotic technologies developed by NASA into the commercial robotics industry. And last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Michael Gernhardt, who is a NASA astronaut and manager of the Environmental Physiology Laboratory and principal investigator of the Pre-Breathe Reduction Program at NASA Johnson Space Center. Mike began his career as a professional deep sea diver. Then after becoming vice president of Oceaneering International, he founded Oceaneering Space Systems with the goal of transferring subsea technology and operational methods to the NASA space program. Mike joined NASA in 1992 where he worked on the development of nitrox diving to support training for the Hubble Space Telescope repair and on a variety of space station EVA developments. I had to look up nitrox, <laughs> that just sounded fascinating. It refers to any nitrogen oxygen gas mixture with more than 21% oxygen, as is found in normal air. <laughs> he also led an international research team in developing the new exercise pre-breathe protocol that improved the safety and efficiency of spacewalks at the International Space Station. Mike is a veteran of four shuttle missions from 1995 to 2001, and he's logged over 43 <coughs> days in space including four spacewalks totaling 23 hours and 16 minutes. He was also a crew member on NEMO, which we mentioned earlier, and served as commander of the NEMO eight multi-day underwater missions. So we have really a fantastic panel, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, so I'll start off with a few framing slides here, if, if you could bring that up. Uh, so uh, this is humans and robots together on Mars and uh, I think for effective missions in the future to really explore Mars and to search for signs of ancient microbial life or even present microbial life, uh, it's important to have both of those, those features there, the humans and the robots. So go to the next chart. Uh, you know, human missions to Mars will require uh, robots interacting with human vehicles and systems to provide a number of functions including uh, uh, overhead and surface reconnaissance so that the humans know where they're going, where to land. Uh, telecommunications relay is essential. Uh, logistics placements and transfers, moving equipment around, getting ready for uh, people to land, uh, uh, getting all the surface infrastructure ready. Uh, Tele-operated access to extreme terrain and special regions. There will be areas that astronauts will want to explore, but they won't be able to get there themselves, so they can use robots to help access those regions, regions and get scientific samples and, and explore those areas. And, and also surface element mobility, inspection, and maintenance, just to make sure everything is working okay. And uh, also uh, vehicles for, for humans to drive around in. Uh, robots would most likely be required for any in situ resource utilization operations if we're going to drill for ice and, and uh, uh, access ice and uh, uh, do, uh, you know, processes to create uh, lox uh, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen uh, or use the atmosphere. Probably all that would be done robotically. 
uh, all of the mining and the processing of the material. And uh, I think it's important to note that the Artemis lunar surface robotic elements are important for developing these technology systems and operations and for retiring risks for these human robotic systems. So it's really a proving ground for getting all of this human robotic infrastructure in place and operational so we can use them for missions to Mars. Uh, robotic vehicles are integral to uh, architecture and programmatic planning for crewed missions to Mars. And uh, the synergy and interaction between human and robotic systems needs to be planned for in an integrated way. And, and I think that's a challenge for us to, uh, to really do all of this planning for the next 20 years to get everything we need in place to be able to have the synergy between the humans and the robots. So go to the next chart. And these are just some robotic vehicle concepts to support human missions, just some examples. So uh, on, the, uh, on the lower left, there's this vehicle that looks kind of like a giant spider with all of these legs with wheels on the bottom. And that's the, uh, the athlete rover that NASA has developed. We've done a lot of testing with that. And uh, this is like a heavy lifter that can be used to relocate large elements. If you wanted to offload a habitat from a lander platform and move it to another position, which is what's shown in that, uh, in that photo there, uh, this is a useful vehicle for that, possibly for moving nuclear reactors to site them in a location where you want them. Uh, also, other examples would be civil engineering type vehicles for digging and moving regolith. Uh, and site preparations and other construction. I mean, ultimately, it would be nice to have some kind of concrete-type landing pad for vehicles to land on on Mars so you don't have to worry about debris being blown up everywhere, and robotic vehicles could be useful for that kind of civil engineering construction. Uh, also, moderate to deep drilling systems, if you're going to drill into ice or even do very deep drilling to try to access uh, underground water reservoirs or to search for signs of uh, extant microbial life on Mars, you know, that would be done with, with robotic deep drilling systems. Uh, fine manipulator rovers to configure crew transfer tunnels, ISRU connections, troubleshooting and contingency deployment of solar arrays and, and, and thermal radiators and performing inspections and repairs. You know, there will be a lot of things that would need to be hook up if you, hooked up if you're going to do uh, ISRU to create rocket propellant, you're going to have to hook up a bunch of lines. If you're going to deploy nuclear reactors, you're going to have to uh, reel out cables maybe a kilometer or more in distance and hook those things up. And, and we need robots with fine manipulator controls to be able to do that. Also, telecom relay rovers will be important as you have crews going out long distances. They're going to go over the horizon and they need to communicate back to the surface lander or the surface habitat. And having relays will be important for the telecommunications. Uh, if you're going to access special regions like uh, ice or possible uh, uh, re recurring slope linea where, that might have water content there, these are special regions that you may only be able to access with sterilized vehicles so that we don't contaminate them with human microbes. And so sterilized rovers could be used to access these regions and then astronauts could control them and, and get samples back from those sterilized vehicles. Also doing extreme terrain exploration. Uh, going over cliffs, going into caves, those would require specialized robotic vehicles that, that humans would use. Uh, there's an example shown on the right side, that's a rover called Lemur, which uh, uses insect-like grabbing features on their claws to actually climb up uh, cliffs and climb down cliffs. And in the middle uh, on the bottom is the Axel Rover, which is a two-wheeled rover that, that can go over cliffs. There are some interesting features in the northern latitudes where there are exposed ice scarps. These are just cliffs of exposed pure water ice and it would be really cool to have an axle rover go over the edge and explore the edge of that ice and also to be able to explore the interface between the ice and the regolith beneath it and also the, the thin regolith on top and the ice and so you'd be able to access that with this type of a rover. And then recently we've seen the great success of the Ingenuity helicopter which Dave will talk about later. Uh, he's, he's been managing that and using helicopters for reconnaissance and for telecom relay and other functions, I think that will be very important for the uh, human missions. And so that's it for my material. And uh, I think we're over, hand it to, over. Uh, Rick. to Rick. Okay. Um, so, uh, so a couple things. Uh, first of all, there have been a number of initiatives to actually ask the question: What is it that humans will really be doing there that's worth the significant investments for sending humans all the way out to our second planet? And uh, there was a study done at NASA headquarters in 2019 that was ac across all the mission directorates 
Um, there has been an ESA strategy that Sanjay uh, alluded to in this morning's thing, and now there's been the decadal uh, that's been released in the United States and is still being looked at by NASA. In all three of those, though, you see uh, really something that Toppy alluded to, which is this idea that we have been uh, following the water and in the intent of trying to understand whether life existed on Mars or whether it's still there. And really, where it's driven us is into the subsurface. And there are a number of reasons for that, but bottom line is that with the radiation environment at Mars, it, it, the general assumption is that if life existed at Mars, it has probably moved to the subsurface and is probably near the ice. Uh, and, that's, and so accessing that ice uh, with human beings, because that, um, and potentially even doing core drilling like we do in Antarctica, is a non-trivial combination of humans and robots. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really a, a key and exciting uh, growing awareness of what we will probably be doing with human beings. Um, and that leads to my next point, which is that this paper, this piece right here is, I work with the, uh, I'm a secretariat for the International Mars Exploration Working Group. It's a, uh, a working group of 27 space agencies uh, across the planet. And about four or five years ago, they jointly began developing a set of needed reconnaissance thrusts. These are things that would enable human spaceflight. And in that center, I would point you to the whole water ice story, because basically what it is saying is that uh, it sort of supports this new idea that we're going to be ice coring and that we have to get uh, into the ice. And there's two pieces to that robotically. Um, and uh, first of all, with the uh, MRO, our workhorse out at Mars uh, that has a radar, when we sent it out, we were looking for deep aquifers. We didn't really find deep aquifers. What we found were these amazing ice sheets very close to the surface. And unfortunately, that radar had no, uh, essentially the frequency it was used gives us a blind spot in the zero to 10, zero to 15 meter region. And so we can't really say that the ice is there. And so uh, closing that gap, because unfortunately for both science, if you're core drilling in, into an unknown uh, regolith on top of, or overburden, and then into that ice, which is billion-year-old ice and as hard as anything, you want to minimize how much of that drilling you have to do. And eventually, any architecture going to Mars is assuming that we are producing propellant locally at Mars because it's at the end of what we call a long uh, delta V chain. And if you can produce uh, kilograms of, uh, of propellant there, you save a fortune in terms of what we have to uh, send all the way out to the second planet. And so it may not be immediately, but every serious architecture assumes that we are eventually producing oxygen, which is what uh, the MOXIE experiment uh, has been testing to. And then also um, methane, which is where, and you need that hydrogen in the water. And so we, and again, you do not want to be drilling down meters and meters and meters through very difficult stuff for either the coring type idea or for ISRU. So really closing that gap is key. So one thing is sending out a next generation radar out there so that we can actually have the right frequencies and see where it starts at the top and then goes down. And I think there is a growing consensus too that if the humans go, you know, we're basically all microbial sacks, you know, that's sort of a microbial view of us. <laughs> um, but the point being is that there is a lot of uh, discussion now underway under, for having a robotic mission to go do controlled data points of accessing that ice um, and understanding what's there before humans do it with more significant robots and drilling equipment so that we really have a very clean data point here. And so there you have this water story where you get a radar out there and then you ultimately send potentially a robotic mission out there and then you, the humans go out there and do their magic, which is really having worked ISS for many years, is really a wonderful combination of the humans and robots. There are other things we really need to do robotically uh, before we go, and this is where you start to see an emerging consensus here, at least amongst the space agencies, but there's a lot more work to be done on this. So we've talked yesterday about Mars sample return mm -hmm. from an enable human stand the space flight standpoint, that does a number of things. It is a round trip demonstration. We've never done that to Mars. That's big. Uh, secondly, 
Um, we know uh, that if the particle sizes on Mars are the wrong size, they can act like asbestos and get stuck in your lungs, and there are hazards with that. And there, so there are breathing hazards to understand, and so those would just be two examples there. We've only imaged about 4 to 5% of the planet in high resolution imagery, and the science that has come back from that is absolutely outstanding. However, um, the next generation and, and they prep for humans, we really probably need to be thinking about moving that number up to the entire planet. Um, and that is a very enabling capability for both science and human exploration if, if we can get there. Also, today it was mentioned in the ESA presentations, but next generation weather is really key. We cannot predict these dust storms. We don't have enough uh, in terms of data coming back from the planet. There's a lot we need to do that. We probably need to understand density profiles because these spacecraft that are going to be entering for human systems are big and they're using propulsion, but they still need the drag there, and it's really helpful to understand those density profiles that are there. Um, and then I I think I've covered all that. Actually, the one thing is these some of these pieces are data hogs. And you know, we have a challenge right now at Mars in, in terms of uh, uh, assets becoming old, and we're going to need to fix that. And that we know how to do that. But if you're talking about synthetic aperture radars or significantly higher volumes of high resolution imagery. We're going to have to go to more Earth-like systems to enable large volumes of data to come back from Mars that we have not been able to do to date. And that is really a next generation change. And really, what does that mean? That means you put your communications assets just like we do at Earth up high so that you can uh, have this, the Earth always in sight and you can pump data up to it, which is what we do, with, for example, with geosynchronous satellites. We just need to apply those lessons learned to Mars. And so anyway, that's a kind of a quick and dirty overview, but all those things, I think you see the piece with um, at least the, the science that humans can do in terms of accessing that ice, and then that backflows is a number of requirements in there. And then you can see these other things, which really we need um, our robotic missions to probably answer before humans actually set out there. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and we have two mics who are joining <laughs> us virtually. That's right. So uh, I think we'll go to uh, Dr. Michael Hecht next to talk to us some about MOXIE. Let's see, I'm not <laughs> sure we can hear you. Uh, yeah, I got a mug somewhere that says you're on mute. You know, I, I, gotcha. I, I should have brought that instead of this one. <laughs> okay, Wade, let's go for it. You've got the slides, right? I do hear a bit of an echo, but I will talk through it if you don't hear it. Okay, I guess we're good. Um, Glad to be here. And let's go ahead to the next slide. You know all this stuff. I need to give a brief overview of MOXIE. And we're supposed to be talking about robotics and humans, but this is the context. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please, wait. There you go. So MOXIE, very briefly, is a scale model of the kind of plant we would use with potentially the first human mission or the second human mission to Mars to produce oxygen primarily for propellant so that the astronauts you know, uh, will be able to get back to orbit at the end of their mission um, and won't end up like Mark Watney, in other words. <laughs> so 1 to 200 or 1 to 300 scale or so has to do not with the size. It has to do with the production of oxygen. The scaling is really favorable, as I'll show you in a minute, but it has to do with how much power we can get on the Perseverance rover, which is our ride. You know, you've got to take your ride where you get your ride, and we don't get much energy, we don't get much space. So we're doing a small scale, which allows us to demonstrate most of what we need to demonstrate in order to build confidence in this technology to beat down risk and, yes, to raise the TRL. So what we can make now is about 6 to 10 grams of uh, propellant-grade oxygen or breathing-grade oxygen, the same thing, 99.6% like ivory soap, uh, we can make that per hour. And if I, we did that twice, you could probably breathe on it. Right now, a small dog could breathe on it. 
but just for ref for calibration, this is like a modest sized tree. So to do what we need to do for the human mission, we'd have to have a forest of hundreds of trees, or we could just have a kind of a, a chest freezer sized version of Moxie to do the same thing. And that's what we're after. So let's, we'll flip through a few slides quickly to give you an idea of how this works. Uh, the next slide is, you know, again, don't worry about the details. Basically, CO2 goes in, carbon monoxide comes out, and oxygen comes out. In other words, we pluck one oxygen ion off of each CO2 by this electrochemical cell. The oxygen is the only thing that can go through that gray region in the middle, you know, the membrane, the electrolyte. So that's how we separate them and make them pure. And when you drive an oxygen ion through to the other side, it will immediately, it's at 800 degrees C, by the way, it will immediately recombine and make an oxygen molecule of O2. The reason we leave one oxygen atom behind in the form of CO is so we can stay entirely in the gas phase and not have to deal with solid carbon. And we work really hard to do that because it's, it's really easy to tweak the voltage a little higher and start depositing carbon. We have to avoid that. Uh, the, and the end, you stack up a bunch of these things. They look like the little picture in the bottom left, where you see the three tubes, the CO2 in, the CO mixed with unused CO2 coming out, and the oxygen exhaust. So if we can flip forward, we'll see a few pictures. Uh, this is how it goes together. The upper left is what we started with, that stack of electrochemical cells. We, they get put in an assembly, number two, where they're insulated so they can be heated to 800 C. They're held together with springs so they don't move around, and they, they maintain good electrical contact. They're put in a box, and that whole thing is put in, ends up in that gold box uh, in the lower right, along with a scroll pump, which you see in number three, and that's the object on the bottom left of the assembly in number four. And if you can flip through the next bunch of slides, just a couple of seconds. Oh, you're in PDF. Well, I guess you're not gonna flip through them, and we'll save time. Um, there's a whole bunch of slides lying on top of each other in the PowerPoint. Okay, uh, so I wish you could, we could show you great pictures of oxygen being made on Mars or even on Earth, but you know, it's an odorless, colorless gas, and uh, other than a feeling of elation, you don't even know what's happening. So uh, we warm up to 800 C for a couple of hours. We produce oxygen and measure it and keep track of it uh, for about an hour at which point the rover battery says enough, stop, you know, you've used our power for the day, go do something else, and we produce five, six, seven, eight grams of oxygen depending on the experiment, and we measure the purity, et cetera. So if you can go ahead to the next slide real quickly, um, uh, one of the key things we measure is how much abuse we're giving this thing by turning it off, cooling it down to Mars temperature, and heating it up to 800 degrees C. It's something you never want to do with these systems. And we have to do it every time we run because we're just one passenger on a very crowded rover. So uh, we work really hard, uh, we being largely the Ceramitec company, which is now Oxion uh, Energy, uh, to keep the damage from that cooling and heating cycle down to a low level. And to give you a reference, I mean, we can go up to about 1.5 on this scale of area-specific resistance before we even have to turn down the oxygen production. So we could go for many, many tens of cycles, 60, 70, 80 uh, cycles without even having to turn things down. So we're feeling really good about that. This is data from Mars. This is the real deal. And so, so is the next slide, is data from Mars looking at purity. And to give you an idea what this is about, it turns out you know, the only way you can get impurity in the oxygen is from the carbon dioxide you're processing. If it crosses over from the cathode side to the anode side through micro cracks or whatever. And to avoid this happening, you keep the pressure a little high on the CO2 side. And this is something we can control, and you can see in the left, 100%. If you see, if you start having overpressure of CO2, you start getting a little bit of intrusion of CO2 into the oxygen. Not a lot, we're still in the high 99s. Uh, but it, this just tells you how we have to operate the full scale system. It's not a problem, it's useful information. So that's just to give you a taste of the sorts of things we're learning. Um, let's go ahead and uh, show you what we're doing on Mars real quickly. The Mars seasons offer a real challenge to MOXIE in the way that they wouldn't on Earth because the air density changes tremendously. From day to night, the top curve is night, the bottom curve is day. 
and from season to season. And here we have the full march and year laid out from left to right. These are all models, all those noisy things. Uh, I won't explain now why the models are noisy, but we wanted to run at different times of year. The part on the right side is very dusty. We're getting into that season now. In fact, this UR here line needs to move over by, you know, by 60 or 70. Uh, we're in the 440s now. Um, so I need to redo the slide and move that line over. So this was the original idea, but um, uh, if you look at the orange arrows, which were another slide, uh, you'll see when we actually ran. Now, if you go back a second, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean, there you go. Those are when we actually ran. So we're keeping with the program, but we're inserting some extra runs to do things like the purity measurements and measure resistance leads and things. Okay, now go ahead and we'll start getting to the tasty stuff, which is what's this gonna look like in the future? Oxion Energy is already building electrolysis stacks. So you see in the lower, in that picture in the lower right, you see in the lower left, the stack we flew with Moxie and on the right, an experimental, you know, big stack they're building that um, would, you know, a few of these would satisfy the need we, for propulsion for a human mission. Uh, similarly with the soil pump, uh, there are scale models, scaled up models being built. So uh, graduate student Eric Hinterman just did a really detailed dissertation work on how you scale these things up to support a human mission. He called it a big, quote, atmospheric moxie uh, with the acronym BAM, and you can figure out what that really means. Um, but remembering it needs to operate continuously for over a year and needs to be power efficient. And the point of all these little pie charts is that with moxie as we have it now in the lower left, you see that the actual electrolysis is a tiny part of the power consumption. This just won't do. But fortunately, these things scale almost free as you scale it up and run it a little lower pressure. So by the time we get to the bottom right hand, the projection for BAM, we have the majority of the power going to electrolysis, the next biggest chunk going to something we didn't even do on MOXIE, which is liquefying the oxygen into a tank, and all the other stuff is receded into those little tiny wedges. So basically this means any technique that's splitting CO2 molecules to make an oxygen, is, is not, is, none of them are gonna be more efficient than this approach in terms of power, that's the bottom line, because you can't change the energy you need to pull the molecules apart, no matter how you do it, with lasers, with plasmas, whatever you do. So we're really excited that we'll be able to get such incredibly high efficiency on the projected flight system. And that's something else we've learned from Moxie. So where do, you, where do robotics come in? Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, and yeah, one more slide. We don't need to look at, uh, you know, uh, high risk conceptions on Mars. First of all, why are we doing this? Well, on Earth, we take oxygen for granted, but it in fact is the thing, the oxidizer are necessary to burn anything. And when you burn a log in the fire or you drive your car, if you, drive a kilo, if you burn a kilogram of gas in your car, you're burning several kilograms of oxygen to go along with it. That's the heavy part. If I translate this into rocket fuel, if you were using um, you know, um, a locked liquid oxygen methane, you would have to take, even to burn seven tons of methane, you'd need 25 or 26 tons of oxygen, plus the oxygen astronauts need to breathe. So if we can just make the oxygen on Mars out of the atmosphere, you know, no retrieval, no mining, no excavation, we're saving um, I mean, up to 30 tons of stuff you would have to take to Mars with a human mission, and we're cutting a good part of that umbilical cord to Earth. So that's why we're doing it. But from a system like MOXIE, you can also extract uh, nitrogen uh, from, you know, from the two or three percent in the air as part of the, as part of the cryogenic process. You can use the snow for fuel, and that's a whole other topic we could discuss for a long time, how you use CO for fuel. So there's multiple products out of this uh, full system that, that we could take advantage of for many purposes. Uh, so the next slide then, which I think is a penultimate slide. It's okay, I mentioned in addition to oxygen, I think Rick and other, uh, Rick mentioned we need water for fuel. Uh, and I don't mean we're going to burn water. I mean, if you want to make methane, you need hydrogen. Uh, you need water for agriculture. You need water for vehicles. You need water for us. 
brush our teeth for our fuel. Um, <laughs> we need minerals to build landing stress habitats. Rick went through this. I'm particularly big in using perchlorate in the soil. I think we could set up a solid rocket booster uh, manufacturing facility on Mars once we have an established base. And for all these things, we need robots. And the significance of Moxley is we have to power those robots. Okay, and, and you know, oxygen is going to be um, a key part of that power and we can't just plug into a fission reactor. Um, and vice versa, we need, of course, to power Moxley's system, not uh, power, but bring resources to these plants, whether it's the oxygen, we don't have to move. But if we want water, we have to bring it back. And uh, I'm bigger on driving a truck to the permafrost and on drilling, but that's a whole other discussion. And so this is how Moxie fits into this. Um, it's, it's powering the robots we're going to use, and it's employing the robots to bring resources. And you have Moxie and other ISW systems. So I think there's one more slide, and then I won't be quiet because I've gone on well past the limit. No, there's not. There's just, uh, uh, thanking all of our participants and our sponsors, and I will stop there uh, and hopefully leave time for questions. Great. Excellent briefing. Sounds like Moxie. A lot is riding on the success of Moxie here. Um, and it's looking really, really good. Yes, excellent. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about some interesting uh, precursor missions for for humans to Mars. Um, now let's hear from Dr. Sherry Holder as she talks about some of the work she's doing to look at interaction between, between the robots, robotic missions, and humans on Mars. Sherry? Hello. Hello. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. And yes, we're primarily focused on human-robot interaction uh, at a high level all the way down to experiments looking at interfaces themselves. So uh, next slide, please. So I work at Draper. Draper is well known for a host of core capability areas that, uh, that are used in space. Uh, those include mission scheduling and management. Probably our most well known is guidance and navigation and control, where we've been known for working on guidance for landing since the Apollo days and human systems engineering. Uh, next slide, please. So if I'm gonna start at the very top, uh, the HARI study, I think was mentioned in the introduction, was focused on human automation, robot interaction. <laughs> but if we're gonna look at what we wanna research and what we wanna study and grow, the first question is, okay, which areas will help forward our, our understanding and forward our abilities in HARI uh, for uh, the moon, Mars, and beyond. Uh, so how do we prioritize what to, what to tackle first? Uh, and we wound up taking this trade study approach of different research areas and technology areas, and we found three, our top three tech development areas were machine learning, autonomous obstacle detection imaging, which is very much tied into navigation and navigation of uh, robots on Mars and beyond. Uh, and then uh, human robot, uh, information interfaces. So how are you reading the information from the robot and how is the, the robot getting information from you? Um, and our top three research areas were improving training. So making sure that the human can train for the right systems and be prepared for the appropriate tasks. Uh, establishing trust in your automation and your robotic systems. And, that, and on the flip side, number three was understanding human intent. So how does the robot understand and predict what the human is doing uh, and be able to work with them. Next slide, please. And a key factor within human systems engineering is making sure that we can capture uh, the human element and the interaction between the human and the automation throughout the entire life cycle of a program from when we first start coming up with a mission plan all the way through to the execution. Uh, so we don't want to think about uh, our robotic systems and knowing that they interact with humans without thinking about how they work together. Effective teaming with machines requires that the machines understand the humans and the humans also understand the machines in order to be able to adapt to each other in their environments and understand what it is they need to do to conduct their tasks. So we have taken several different approaches trying to figure out how we can best frame 
the, uh, the entire design cycle to capture the human in the loop and the relationship for that human machine team. Next slide, please. Uh, so get working our all, all way all the way down to experiments. Uh, so this part uh, I find the most fun out of m pretty much everything I do. I love this part is uh, <laughs> is real time performance metrics. This is uh, studying uh, what it. Uh, what is the state of the human as they're operating a vehicle? In this case, the, the, the system within the real-time performance metrics platform that I work the most with is a lunar landing simulator where the human is trying to fly a lunar landing uh, with autonomous guidance. So they're basically taking the advice of the computer to try and land a vehicle. Um, it provides a way to measure the performance workload and the situation awareness, so the awareness of the system and what's going on. Uh, in both manual or semi-autonomous tasks where maybe the computer is helping on some level. Uh, it also ideally provides real-time feedback to the human so they are more aware of how they're performing, how they're doing, and can make corrections as they need to. Um, we've collected data with the simulators in Hera, and you see that great big platform at a desk right there, and then when you see the smaller platform, that's a laptop and a joystick. Uh, on the NEMO mission that was uh, uh, sunk for being able to capture data on NEMO. Uh, and it, you notice it's a little tricky. So you've got, the, got a couple of displays there where you can see what the human is, is doing. They've got a map and they've got their guidance. Uh, they also have uh, some tasks that go on in the background that allow us to measure uh, if they're overloaded, how their, how their workload is, how their cognitive load is. Um, and they also make call-outs throughout uh, where we ask them to uh, specify specific altitudes, specific fuel numbers that they need to identify uh, so that they can uh, give us a sense of their awareness of the system as they're going through. So, uh, let's see, I think. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. So one of the elements that's that's also within this, the, one of the is trust and autonomy. So you notice the focus with the real-time performance metrics was to be able to measure uh, the human without any sensors and be able to understand their state in a non-invasive way. Another key thing we need to understand is the human trust in the system and find ways to improve that trust. The Draper trust heuristics are essentially a survey scale that allow us to take a look at how much the human trusts the system and how well the system is doing to, cr to foster that trust. So in the case of giving insight into current system behavior, you're asking not just, is the system telling the human what it's doing? Is the system telling the human what it's doing and why? Is it giving the reasons? Is it doing so frequently? How well is it explaining it? Is, are the reasons clear? Um, and by getting that feedback from the human uh, throughout development, you can actually improve the human trust in the system by the end of the, uh, of the design development cycle. Uh, so we've got a lot of fascinating research that I absolutely enjoy all focused on trying to get humans and robots to trust each other. <laughs> I you're doing, you got a great job. <laughs> <laughs> so neat. Fascinating. Um, we're going to shift back a little bit to a precursor mission. And uh, what's not to love about ingenuity? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just fascinating to see the, the pictures that are coming back. So, Dave Lavery, would you tell us about the program? Okay, if we can have the first slide up. Yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn to get back to some of the stuff similar to what. Uh, Mike Hatch was talking about with Moxie, of an example of s some current efforts right now that are active precursor activities that hopefully are paving the way to being able to answer a couple of the questions that are being posed by, by some of the other research. Um, next chart. So a real quick video to describe the Ingenuity Mars helicopter and what was intended by that, uh, the technology experiment that it, that it represented. The fundamental question we all had was, can you actually fly in the atmosphere of Mars? And a year and a half later, I can safely say yes, <laughs> but when we started this, that was not a foregone conclusion at all. 
the concept behind the experiment was to have a small helicopter that would be folded up underneath the bottom of the Perseverance rover as its ride to Mars. And it would take Perseverance uh, down to the surface. The rover would then drop off the helicopter uh, that would then be deployed and begin its flight experiments. After that uh, initial deployment from the rover, the rover and the helicopter never physically contact each other ever again. The helicopter is, for all intents and purposes, its own self-contained spacecraft. Everything you would have on a typical spacecraft, thermal, power, communications, uh, actuation systems, everything else are all embodied in the helicopter itself. You go to the next slide. So we deposited the helicopter on the surface of Mars in March and April of last year. And then uh, this is as the rover drove away. We actually got our first clear photograph of the helicopter sitting on the surface. And uh, just to give a, a concept, uh, context, um, we actually landed in the region. Well, let me back up. Our original thought and our expectation was that the rover was going to land and then was going to have to drive away from the landing site some significant distance to find a region that was benign enough to use as an airfield for the helicopter. And then we, after about uh, two or three months of driving, we'd find this location. The helicopter would get dropped off. We would conduct our flight experiment for about a month. And at the, at the end of a month, we would have exa exhausted the helicopter's capabilities with somewhere between three to five flights. We'd be done. The rover would then drive off to the interesting stuff where it would do its primary science mission for the next several years. What actually happened was we landed, we looked around and said, gee, right where we are is a great airfield. It's also really interesting for the rover science team. And so there was a lot of activity that we were able to just immediately start on without having to go very far from the actual landing site. And so this was uh, very shortly after landing where we were able to deposit the helicopter on the surface and get Ingenuity all set up and ready and deployed for the first flight. Uh, next chart. A little bit of context for what we were trying to show and what we're trying to prove. As I mentioned, the purpose behind this was a pure technology experiment to demonstrate that it was possible to fly in the atmosphere of Mars and actually have planetary atmospheric flight as a real demonstrated capability. To do that, we had this small helicopter, weighed uh, 1.8 kilograms, just shy of four pounds. Um, weighed about a pound and a half in Mars gravity. Total size of the rotor, rotors, four feet tip to tip. Two counter-rotating propellers um, mounted on the same central shaft with, if you are familiar with terrestrial full-scale helicopters, you would recognize a lot of the equipment that are there to control the, the pitch and angle and attitude of the rotor disks, swash plates that are familiar with large-scale helicopters on Earth. We have two very small versions that are on Ingenuity to drive the, the rotors. Um, the entire system, as I said, is self-contained. So it's powered by a series of onboard batteries during the flight and uh, overnight for the small heaters that are on board, all of which are cyclically recharged with a small solar array that sits right on the top of the mast just above the, um, above the rotors. Uh, the intent was to be able to have enough energy to uh, fly one time per day. The original design was for something on the order of 60 to 90 seconds. The reality is so far, we've already done 170 second flights, so we've gone well beyond the original design capability. But again, flying once per day and then sitting, sitting down on the surface, recharging the rest of the day, getting enough energy back on board to keep the helicopter warm overnight and be prepared to communicate and fly again very shortly, either the next day or the day after. Um, we uh, use on, or, on the order of about 350 watts of power during a single flight. Uh, uh, blade span, as I mentioned, was just under four feet. Nominally, the blades rotate at somewhere between 25 to 2700 RPM. Again, by contrast, a terrestrial helicopter typical RPM is in the three to 400 RPM range. Our flight range uh, originally was designed to be on the order of 300 meters. Again, we've gone well beyond that right now. We're up to 704 meters for our longest flight so far, um, with potentially more yet to come. Original flight uh, altitude was designed for five meters. We've done uh, flights up to 12 meters at this point. And the whole thing that we've had to contend with in this entire process 
is the Mars environment, and in particular, the very, very thin Mars, Mars atmosphere. At the surface, Mars atmospheric density is about 1% of what it is here on Earth at sea level. The atmospheric uh, density equivalent is like trying to fly at about 100,000 feet on Earth. Uh, typical on Earth right now with most terrestrial helicopters, maximum flight record is about 42,000 feet. So it's well beyond the realm where we're used to flying here on Earth in terms of uh, atmospheric density. Fortunately, in our favor, we also only have to deal with about one-third of the gravity, so you tend to balance out a little bit. Um, I will say, if you had asked us 10 years ago, is this technically possible, there would have been a very definitive answer of no. We could not do this a decade ago. A lot of advances in, in technologies and lightweight systems, advances in materials in particular, the composite materials used for the blades of the rotor, as well as the electronics on board, and be able to shrink them and get them down to a size and form factor uh, that would work for us, as well as the power density of the batteries and improvements that have been made over the course of the last decade have made this possible. Um, and so this is something that really is pushing the edge of what we're capable of doing just very, with very, very recently developed technologies. Next. Okay, Ingenuity actually on the, sitting on the surface of Mars. And I think in the back, if you click on the right-hand side of that slide, that should be a little movie of one of the first flights of Ingenuity with some of the downward-looking cameras. There are uh, two navigation, uh, there are two cameras on board. One, a downward-looking black and white camera that's used for navigation purposes where we're doing frame dif differencing to chart our course and maintain heading throughout the entire flight path. And there's also a forward-looking color camera that we're using as our pseudoscience camera. Uh, but what it does do is give us a, a very nice downward-looking movie as we're able to uh, fly across the Martian <laughs> terrain and then come back in and land. Uh, that, that camera has done very well for us so far and given us a lot of information back in terms of how well the system is able to completely autonomously hold its course, navigate to the de uh, desired target, and be able to come in and autonomously land. Um, it is an open loop landing system right now. We are not actively looking for hazards right now. Uh, we do have the capability, in fact, one of the things we're looking at is the possibility of upgrading some of the onboard software to do hazard avoidance so we can actually fly into some more interesting terrains in the future. Next slide. Uh, a quick sketch, um, a very, very high level detail of where we've been so far. The white line that you can see, if you look off to the right hand side of the image, and there's sort of a big blob at a whole bunch of white points about the middle of the right hand side. That's where we landed, that's where this whole thing started. The white line is actually the, the ground trace of the Perseverance rover. So you can see the rover first went south, hooked over to the west a little bit, and then retraced its path back south, back up the east side, and then up and over across the north, and then over out to the west and the delta where it's located now. And that blue dot on the far left of the image is where the, the rover is currently located. The tan line that's not quite as visible, the, the a bunch of segmented straight lines, those are actually the flight traces of the Ingenuity flights for the 28 flights that is conducted so far. Um, during the first part of, of our excursion, we basically traced along with the rover, actually led the rover in a couple of cases into regions that it was going towards, and then we were able to fly along with it. When it uh, then came back and did that big long excursion up around the top of what's called the Setar region, uh, we were actually able to fly it directly across it in, in uh, a series of uh, four flights and just hopped across that region that was uh, pr uh, prohibitive terrain for the rover itself, where the rover could not drive, and we were able to get to the other side fairly quickly. And the, the blue uh, dot that's sort of towards the center of the image, near the top, that's the current location of the Ingenuity helicopter. They are, as of today, separated by a, just over a, a kilometer um, and still communicating back and forth with the onboard radios. Next chart. Um, okay, so if you look at line number seven, <laughs> you can see, okay, all right. Now, we're not gonna go through this line by line, but here's a quick history of uh, the flights that we have done so far. As I mentioned, we've done 28 flights. Our original flight goal, our mission success criteria was one flight. Can we get aloft, can we hover and demonstrate controlled flight on, one, on another planet for the first time? Yay, mission success, we're done, we're good. 
Uh, truly, that, that, was, that was the mission success criteria. Our, our goal was if we were able to continue that the, the technology experiment would involve up to five flights that would demonstrate increasing levels of capability in terms of extended flight duration, control, traverse, uh, doing autonomous landing, and, and extending the flight envelope. Uh, after those successful flights, because the rover was still in the area and was going to be there for a while more, and we had demonstrated that we actually could have the helicopter keep up with, and in some cases actually lead the rover, we were able to convert from a technology demonstration experiment, conclude that phase of operations, and now become an operational demonstration, where what we were intending to do was show with an extended series of flights for as long as we could, that we had operational utility that provided added value into the rover mission in addition to extending and demonstrating the full capabilities of this particular instantiation of the helicopter. As a result, when we originally decided that we were going to demonstrate somewhere between one and five flights, at to date, we've actually flown 28 times. Our original goal was to fly about 100 meters. We've actually flown just shy of seven kilometers. Our, our design altitude was five meters. We've flown up to 12 meters high. We've got uh, somewhere on the order of 55 minutes of total flight time when the original expectation was on the order of about three minutes. So we've gone well beyond the original design goals and experiment goals of what we're going to do with Ingenuity. And fortunately, it's still going. Next chart. Um, one of the more interesting flights that we also were able to do is that Setar region that I mentioned on one of the earlier charts showing the flight path. Um, over on the western edge was also the impact site of some of the entry, descent, and landing hardware, the back shell and the parachute, from the Perseverance entry, descent, and landing process. And we actually were able to take the helicopter and overfly that hardware and get our first look ever of the EDL hardware after it had done its job. Uh, we have never seen this before in any of the prior rover missions. So we got a good look at, at the hardware and its condition with uh, its impact on the Martian surface after it had completed the, the entry process and actually impacted at an estimated 125 kilometers per hour. And you can see it's pretty well shattered there. Um, the, the parachute is that uh, very, very faint orange and white uh, large area up towards the top of the frame. And if you look at the frame very, very closely, you actually can still see the shrouds connecting the back shell and the parachute. Um, the, the EDL guys got very, very excited about this because they've been building this hardware for years on multiple different missions. They send it off, and you, typically the last time they ever see it was when we button up the spacecraft at, at the Cape and put it inside the, the fairing, and that's the last they ever expect to see any of this. So the fact that we were able to give them this image and say, yeah, guys, your stuff really did make it to Mars, and it, it did its job, and we've actually got proof this time, got, uh, got their interest level quite high. Next image. And I do, I, I do have to just uh, show one final shot of the, the, the team itself that built Ingenuity in relative uh, spacecraft systems uh, teams. This is a fairly small group uh, and, and done on a fairly relatively fast uh, schedule over the course of about three and a half years for the actual flight project. But uh, it, it has been a, a, a really wonderful group to work with and they have been able to achieve truly what we've characterized as another Wright Brothers moment by having an aircraft fly and demonstrate atmospheric flight on another planet. And one of the things that we were very honored to be able to do, uh, and, and you can't quite see it in, in this image, but one of the things we were able to get was a small piece uh, that is being held by one of the team members there of the actual fabric from the original Wright Flyer from 1903 that was then actually attached to the helicopter and taken to Mars with it. So when I say a Wright Brothers moment, I really mean it. <laughs> that there's actually a piece of the Wright Flyer on Mars with ingenuity as well. Uh, last chart. Uh, the one thing we do ask, it, it, please, we, we want people to join in the exploration that we are conducting on Mars with perseverance and with ingenuity. Um, there is a very significant social media presence that um, we are posting the images that we're receiving from Ingenuity and the Ingenuity flight, flight traces literally as fast as we get them. So there's effectively no delay between the time that the images come back and when the flight team gets to see this stuff and when you guys can get to see this stuff. 
and we've had a lot of people have gone out and put together the flight traces, done their own movie bit making uh, out of the navigation camera images as they come back, and done their own flight history to understand what Ingenuity is doing, where it's going, and we love group participation. So we do invite you to come along with us. Uh, hashtag Mars Helicopter on Twitter. Um, mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 for perseverance or slash technology slash helicopter for ingenuity. Please join us. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, this is just incredible. I know when I first started my career, I worked for Bell Helicopter. Mm -hmm. And we used to do uh, non-destructive testing on small segments of the rotors, the, the blades. Mm -hmm. And they probably, that small segment probably weighed 10 times as much as, as Ingenuity does. Um, okay, we're going to move to an exciting talk by our astronaut um, with some incredible activities going on. Um, Dr. Michael Gernhardt, we're gonna turn it over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you. You can bring up the slides. So um, I'm going to bring us back to Earth and actually under the ocean and talk about lessons learned in the subsea industry with integrating humans and robotic oh, work systems. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the story starts back in the 60s with so-called diverless systems. And on the right there is a subsea blowout preventer, which is basically an electro-hydraulic control system. And these the early generations were from aerospace companies like Hughes and Lockheed, and, and they were said to be diverse systems. They had triple redundancy. They weren't supposed to fail, and they failed miserably. And that required the superior you know, judgment, dexterity uh, of human divers to fix them. Next slide. So that actually ushered in saturation diving. And most of you probably know what this is, but we actually live in a chamber on the deck of the vessel that I'm pointing to here. And typically this, this kind of system had six people in it. We work up to depths of a thousand feet and we're breathing less than 1% oxygen with the balance being helium. And 1% change in the oxygen concentration is the difference between acute oxygen toxicity and, and severe hypoxia. Uh, thermally, because we're breathing helium, which has a very high heat capacity for densities, one degree of temperature and, and 1% relative humidity is, is the difference between comfort and discomfort. And 10 degrees and 10% could be life or death. So very challenging life support system. Next slide. So in the, you know, when you're in the dangerous business, I always like to look at the utility equation, which is the probability of excess times the reward minus the probability of failure times the cost. And commercial diving is, is very dangerous business. Um, as a professional, it's important to always balance that utility equation to have a positive outcome. And if the cost of failure is human life, then every effort needs to be applied to reduce the probability of failure or move the humans back from the work site to a safer environment. Next slide. And so this, this is what I call the Darwinian evolution of subsea work systems to reduce the tendency on saturation diving. Next slide. So, so back in the late 60s, British Petroleum developed this robot you see on the left called the Mobot, and it, it was deployed on, on guide wires. Uh, it looks like it came right out of lost in space. Anyhow, it failed miserably. <laughs> um, the, the robot on the right is called the Trove, and in my early diving career, I made lots of money rescuing the Trove when it failed or got tangled up. Okay, next slide. And then uh, at Oceaneering, uh, took another step back where they developed the at atmospheric diving suit. And on the left is the gym suit. So those suits could go up to 2,000 feet, but there was only one uh, atmosphere on the inside. And if you look on the right, you know, we have a hard enough time getting the spacesuit glove to work with, you know, 4.3 PSI delta P, let alone 1,000 PSI delta P. So we developed these end effectors with hooks to pull things and, and special interfaces. And we actually redesigned the subsea equipment to be compatible with these end effectors. But one of the problems is on the left is the gym suit had to walk on a platform to be within the, the work envelope of assessing these valves and so forth. And so the mobility wasn't enough. So next slide. 
so on the left is the jet drum, and this this had a jet pack on the back, you know, sort of like the MMU and NASA. You had to pull your arms inside the suit to fly it, so it, you needed a stopwatch to, 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 to time how long that lasted. And then a, a British gentleman named Graham Hawks invented the watch suit that you see on the right, and it, again, it's at one atmosphere. We fly it with our feet. It's very intuitive. And uh, that, that work system is still very productive today, you know, many years later. Next slide. Another step back was the, what we call the arms bell. And we did a, a joint project with General Electric to develop a force reflecting manipulator. And so inside the bell, which is that one atmosphere, there was a master arm. And it, it's the most intuitive manipulator I've ever used in my life. Um, far better than some of the space robotics. And, here you can see it actually threading a shackle pin, and I don't know if you've threaded a shackle pin lately, but it takes a lot of a lot of dexterity and force feedback to do that properly. So this is kind of analogous to a, a rover on Mars. Okay, next slide. And uh, a friend of mine actually caught a fish with this <laughs> And uh, yeah, I always say if you want to catch a fish, buy a fifty-dollar fishing rod. Don't have a multi-million-dollar manipulator. <laughs> it's very complex and failed a lot. So next slide. So then we moved on to, to sort of a much more simpler robot. This is the Hydra 2 back in the 80s. And it had very simple, robust manipulators. They were just race, bang, bang, control. And we actually changed the interfaces and the tools to allow this simpler, more reliable system to perform the task. So next slide. These are just some examples of some of the early robotic tools. I won't go into great detail on this. Okay, next slide. So back in the mid 80s, I worked on a project to, um, for Placid Oil to basically have a full subsea production facility. Now normally this equipment would be on a platform with people working on the surface, but they wanted to save costs and do everything underwater controlled by robots. Next slide. So th this is kind of the schematic of it. Next slide. And one of the first things is that in robotics, you know, task inter interface engineering is you need to have visual and physical accessibility. So if you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't complete the, ta the task. So the robots would fly up this aisle. Uh, to the right is another one of those blowout preventers. To the left is a tool where we, where, where we with a crane would establish guide post and then drive a pin through that and then bring down the, um, the, the blow up preventer. Next slide. So another thing that, that came out of this is put the simplest part of the system in the, in the hostile environment. And there, there were literally hundreds of valves within the subsea production facility. And instead of having an actuator and a control umbilical on every valve, we routed the, the, the valves out to a interface that a robot could could interface with and and therefore you could you, know, you could have the simpler part underwater and then the robot could come down and actuate multiple valves so that not only saved mass and complexity it saved a lot of expense and it, it worked very well okay next slide and this is an example of kind of where we evolved to and we even got to where we tried to even take the manipulator out of the equation and just de design this standard interface that, that next slide the robot docks to, and we would have different tools inside the docking interface. Um, go to the next slide. Yeah, you see that on the left. This this was the conical interface, became known as the bucket, but we had different tools on work packages below the ROV, which is just a transport bus, and did everything from, from hydraulic connections to turning needle valves, gate valves, et cetera. And then I started Oceanary Space Systems back in 1987, and, and we did lots of task analysis and stuff, but this conical interface sort of morphed itself to the micro-conical interface, which is all over Space Station. And below the, the, that, you can see um, the SPDM grabbing the micro-conical tool so a robot could do it, and then below that, you see the EVA handle. So, so this made the task compatible with both astronauts and robots. So next slide. And this is just sort of a notional series of, let's call this an ROV on Mars that's doing a tanker. You can fly through these, these slides very quickly. So, so think of this as the ROV coming off the lander, keep going. This is sort of a sequence. And so it, it deploys, next slide, next slide. 
and it basically goes back and forth between a propellant lander and the MAV, and using this standard simple interface, does the refueling pass. Next slide. Um, there you go. Okay, next slide. I think this is my last one. And, and so, so basically, we've learned lots of lessons, and we developed a very rigorous methodology to determine whether the task should be done by a robot or a human. It's a very parametric understanding of, of the task. And the bottom line is, you know, don't build a robot and ask, what can I do with it? Start with the task, determine what tasks are candidates for the robot, and then you iter iterate your engineering and interfaces to, to develop the robotic workshop. And that would be the last slide. Thank you. Wow, Mike, so, so thanks, you know, th thank you very much. You know, your undersea work is really a terrific analog to human and robotic interaction in an extreme environment like you would expect to see on Mars. And clearly there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. So I have a really important question to ask you, Mike. When you were breathing that, that oxygen helium mixture, uh, helium mixture, did, did you have high squeaky voices? Oh yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a radio called a helium unscrambler, so the, the top side, Mission Control Crew hears you with a really slow, deep voice, but when you're talking to each other inside the habitat, it's like Donald Duck. And so, you know, <laughs> my first SAT mission, there was this big, gruff guy with a beard, and you know, he's talking like Donald Duck. You know, he, he, he's good after a while. Oh, that's great. Well, we're, we're kind of running low on time here, so we have a list of questions, but I'm just going to pick a couple of them here. And, and one of them I'm going to ask uh, Dave, uh, what are some of the applications for future rotorcraft on Mars? We've, we've looked at, at a, a huge series of possible uses for helicopters and other rotorcraft, rotorcraft, for that matter, aircraft on Mars. And as you might expect, they sort of run the gamut the same way they do here on Earth. But some of the more obvious ones and, and that they're, they're near-term achievable, certainly as scouts, as precursors, as pathfinders for surface assets, other rovers, actually Ingenuity has already done that. It's explored regions. The Perseverance was possibly considering going, and by finding out information, the science team said, yeah, we don't need to go that way, instead we're going to go th this way. And so that sort of operation is, is pretty obvious. But also just being able to take science instruments into regions that surface rovers just can't go. Looking at cliff sides, or for that matter, the top of cliff areas that the rover can't drive up and around to. Um, are, are some of the things we're looking at. We're also looking at possibilities for things like uh, explorers inside lava tubes when we, did, when we get to find those sort of assets. Um, another one that's also near term that is a possible consideration is doing sensor emplacement, actually taking very small payloads, flying them out to regions that the rovers aren't going to go to, and, and placing small payloads, or for that matter, collecting samples and bringing them back for, for uh, assay. And so there's a whole suite of different things that, that are possible. And then very, very far term out um, in terms of direct support for human operations, we're looking at things like, again, deploying sensors for regions where humans might want to go, taking tools out to humans or retrieving them back. Uh, basically is, is a safety system. Uh, a human is out in the field, something happens, and they need to get uh, either a signal back or communication back that can be provided by the helicopter. Mm. So there's a, a huge myriad of applications. Great. That's cool. Uh, I have a question for Sherry. Uh, what do you see as a common thread across uh, research on human-robot interaction? Oh, definitely trust. Yeah, okay, yeah. trust. Yeah, you, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, uh, so... Not, so when it comes to trust and, uh, mm -hmm. and autonomy, it's one of those things that we're constantly chasing. But if you think about everything, whether it's a, uh, a robot that's fully a fully autonomous robotic uh, mm -hmm. rover, uh, an, a, a tele-operated vehicle or a robot arm, or it's a vehicle that the human is riding in and working with the autonomy uh, to drive, mm -hmm. Uh, no matter what, the, uh, the, it ke just keeps coming back to, can the human work with the system? Can the system trust the yeah. human? And if you think about uh, that Hari study and each of those key research areas, whether it's even just proving the, re the reliability of the mm -hmm. technical area, uh, of the technology itself, or working on training, uh, or understanding what the human wants out of the system, it's all about trust between the two. Cool. Okay, the, the shepherd's hook hasn't come out yet, so uh, let's see if we can take a question from the audience. And uh, with the lights, I cannot see anything out there. But 
but if anybody has a question, uh, you can step up to the microphone. No? No questions? The hook, okay, hey. we're right on time. <laughs> Thanks, Happy and Linda.